Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of The Rock Experience with Mike Brunn. On this episode, I'm really excited to have joining me Rick Fox. This was a really long interview, almost three hours, so I'm going to break it up into two parts. This first part, Rick is going to share with us his experiences seeing KISS back in the early days. By the early days, I'm talking about 1972 and 1973 when they were a club band. Rick has a lot of great stories that I know KISS fans are going to really enjoy. He'll also share with us what it was like being a part of bands in the New York club scene in those mid-70s time periods. Lots of great stories here that you guys are going to love, no doubt. Part 2, we're going to cover his involvement in the early 80s LA rock scene. So there's so much to cover, so much you guys are going to really enjoy. But now, here's part 1 of my interview with Rick Fox. Well, you know, I think most KISS fans, most rock fans wish that they went through the experiences that you have. So, and, you know, we're going to touch on, on all of those today. I know KISS fans are going to love your stories and you know, just fans of 80s rock bands are going to love your story as well. But before we get into those details, just for people who maybe don't know you and yourself, you know, you grew up in the New York area, teenager growing up in that, in the New York scene, late 60s, early 70s. What music were you listening to? Oh, boy. 60s i don't know how when when exactly how and when this happened uh, uh gary puckett and the union gap came across my radar and i i dug their look they all wore civil war uniforms so they all looked uniform uh they looked like they were together and you know in the same gang kind of thing and and you know gary puckett's a crooner and and a real smooth voice uh the people who are writing the material for him were writing very risque lyrics for for the for the age but uh, uh, I was I was listening to that stuff, you know. That's when I, I wanted to start growing my hair over my ears. To which my <laughs> my, my father said, "Uh, uh-uh, uh, not in this house," <laughs> you know. And and that stuck around sixty seven, I think, sixty six, sixty seven. By sixty eight, I already started to have uh, you know harder rock bands come on under my radar. Then I see, get down. My cat wants to climb on my lap. Yeah, uh, special guest with us. <laughs> Not not across these keyboards. Uh-uh. <laughs> there you go. So uh, um, uh, I heard uh, status on the radio. I, I had a little a little uh, AM AM radio that I used to have a lot of like a lot of us. I had it on my pillow, and I would listen to the music at night until the batteries ran dead. Hmm. Uh, but eventually, um, status quo pictures of matchstick men, you know, uh, whatever was on the top forty uh, in sixty eight sixty nine. And then uh, I was watching, I think it was American Bandstand and along with Ed Sullivan and the other shows, the variety shows and Steppenwolf came on and something about that just spoke to me about what they were, they were, I got it. I understood what John Kay's lyrics were. I understood he was, his, a lot of stuff was political. They were a, a blues, somewhat a little bit country-ish, but, but heavy, you know, they turn up the volume. And uh, right after that, my my cousin got me my first two albums, LPs that I ever got, was the Beatles' Rubber Soul, which is a, a great album to start with, yeah. and and uh, Steppenwolf's first album. So I, I listened to both of them till I till the you know I wore them out, but uh, I really started to uh, favor over blend over towards the Steppenwolf stuff. I, I really understood what their their lyric content was. Uh, something about their music just spoke to me, reached in and, and got my, my soul. And, 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 you know, when I saw uh, their bass player, Nick St. Nicholas on, on TV, 
And he had, you know, uh, one of his outfits. He, he wore several different things. So, <laughs> some of them, I don't know. I don't think people today would remember what a muumuu was. But, uh, you know, our, our moms and grandmothers wore those around the house. Yeah. Uh, Nick, Nick was known for wearing really weird outfits. Uh, but the, the best one I remember, it was a buckskin fringe jacket uh, and le black leather pants. And he was either playing a Rickenbacker bass or a, 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 a Gibson EB3. And when I saw him, you know, just kind of doing his thing there, and uh, just, I said, "That's it. That's what I want to be. That's I want to be. I want to be like him. I want to be a bass player." That's awesome. Now you mentioned your dad before wanting you to cut your hair. Were your parents into music at all, or was this like like you were rebelling against your parents by listening to this music? No. What's What's funny is is, uh, and I was just telling this on another interview the other day. My father was was fully, ex you know, into music. Uh, you know, in, in his era, you know, when he was uh, 17, 18, 19, you know, it was big band and swing and, and sure. Frank, Sinat Frank Sinatra, another crooner yeah. like that. And so when he got out of the Navy uh, after the after the Korean War, he used his GI Bill to put himself through broadcast school. So he he created while he was in the school, they were just about ready to graduate. And uh, he said it was a knock at the door, the classroom door, the teacher opened the door, and this guy walks in from, I don't know, CBS or something, and he goes, who wants to start now? And without batting an eyelash, my father was the first one to put his hand up, <laughs> said, right here. So he says, follow me. And he is, as I remember my dad relayed this to me. And uh, he took him to some place where they started to uh, introduce him to you know, broadcast radio. And they put him on a, a, a radio station in Long Island, Long Island. Uh, where I'm w from. <laughs> WGBB in Freeport. Okay. This is before radio had a union. And uh, he put together his own uh, uh, big band swing show. Nice. And he, uh, was, he interviewed artists on the air like we're doing now, you know, like that uh, at the turntable and whatnot. And, and so he, he established this show. Now, the really some of the other interesting points in this is that, uh, well, he took me there one day and I was still a little kid, you know, I was like maybe four years old or something. I remember we walked in and all the walls were that, that really weird institutional mint green color. Mm. Uh, and I remember the booth with the glass window and the engineer's control set up, the panel was on the other side. My father said his, uh, his engineer was George Savalas. Well, George Savalas is the brother of actor Telly Savalas. Okay. From Kojak. You know. Yeah, sure. All right. And he said sometimes uh, uh, Telly would come in and help his brother George engineer my dad's radio show. Oh, wow. And and then, then my, you know, before he passed away, my father was telling me uh, uh, Jennifer Aniston, uh, Telly Savalas is Jennifer Aniston's godfather. Oh, wow. So talk okay. talk about six degrees of separation. <laughs> uh, I certainly would like to meet Jennifer Aniston and tell her that story. That's uh, amazing! So, wow, <laughs> what kind of reaction I get out of that? Oh. But uh, and, and and the weird thing is is before my wife became my wife and came back into my life in two thousand because we had known each other since eighty three eighty four. Uh, when she showed up at my door, I opened the door and I thought it was Jennifer Aniston standing there because she looked like just like her, <laughs> same kind of hair and everything. You know, Jennifer. Aniston meets Lita Ford. That's what my, that's what tomorrow oh, wow. looked like. <laughs> but anyway, so, uh, you know, and then after my dad was done with the, uh, you know, uh, on the day off doing his, uh, whatever he had to do that he brought me there for, he had a, I think he was setting up his, his show for the next day he was on the air. And then he went down the street to a place. They don't have these anymore. It was an ice cream parlor. And we had chocolate egg creams. Oh, love them. So if, <laughs> so if you're from, if you're from New York, you know what a chocolate egg cream oh, is. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and that was that, it was my memory of that. So, to get back to your point, there was music around the house. My dad would play big band, swing music, and like Sinatra, like that. Uh, he didn't play any instruments, but so he told me during our talks over the years, he goes, I saw it. I saw where you were going with it. Um, I wasn't a real big fan of the hard rock stuff, but then my parents were not fans of big band and swing. So, right. you know, and jazz and all of that. He goes, so, so I get it. You know, um, he didn't really uh, hold me back, but he didn't really push me either. It kind of let me kind of, I guess, find it for myself. Find your own way. That's awesome. Yeah. And then so uh, uh, one of the times when I, when my, after my parents split up, I was visiting my mother out in Long Island. She lived in Long Beach. And uh, the, her second husband, uh, um, you know, he, he, 
they, they saw my aspirations towards wanting to be a bass player. And he took me, we went for a ride out to Hempstead and uh, went, went into Sam Ash, the music store. And he says, he wants to be a bass player. What do you got? You know, and I, I'm looking up at the shelf and I see all these, <laughs> all these bass guitars up on the shelf and I point to the Rickenbacker and I went, that's the one. I want that one. <laughs> and and he, I don't know what they were charging for Rickenbackers in, in 1968 or you know 69, but I guess it was a lot out of his budget. So he goes, well, he's just starting out. Do you have anything else you know, we can start, <laughs> start him out with? You know, and I didn't remember about the the, the EB three bases because that was a little bit smaller. That would have been perfect for me. Uh, he went to the basement or something and came back with a you know a, I think it was a Kent bass. It had black vinyl wound on the strings. I didn't know anything about this. I never took any lessons. Uh, nothing formal. I didn't know what chords were. I didn't know what the notes were. I had no absolutely no working background whatsoever. Hmm. So I would take the bass, you know, back to my to my house in Brooklyn. And I'd sit down in the basement, and, and if you got vinyl wa- wrapped around the strings, you can't really hear it. It's really muted. That's more like for, for studio work like that. And uh, I eventually took the pull the vinyl off the strings, but I didn't know how to tune it. I didn't know how to change the strings. I knew zero <laughs> zilch about this. Well, having an electric instrument means nothing without an amp. Sure. <laughs> So we, you know, this is Greenpoint, Brooklyn. We went up to Manhattan Avenue and there was a a radio shack there. My dad bought me a little amp, you know, something I could plug into at least at here. And that's, I brought that home and I'm now I'm trying to uh, uh, hear what's on the, on on the records, on the turntable and just hit and miss trying to, okay, what note is that? And where is this? And where just, like I said, you know, it's like a, Basically trying to teach yourself, it sounds like. It's giving technology to a prehistoric guy. Let him figure it out. <laughs> you know, that's the best I can think of. Sure. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, I didn't have the volume super cranked, but, you know, in a three-family house, you can hear almost right through the walls in the basement. And I'm in the basement, and there's my grandmother going, boom, 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 boom. Turn it down, turn it down down there. Mm-hmm. You know, when I go to my father, Leonard, make him turn it down. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So for you, then it sounds like so because I know also as a teenager, you were into photography, right? So yeah. did the bass playing come before the photography? Were they at the same time? Like, yeah. how did that yeah. work? Yeah, the bass came before the photography. Okay. Uh, in high school, I joined the photography club, because, you know, uh, it would give me access to all of the, they had a developing room. So you had access to all the free film, and, and the developing uh, 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 materials and chemicals. It's a whole dark room, you know, so it gave me an opportunity to learn how to start uh, experimenting with photography. And uh, my dad bought me a, a really expensive 35 millimeter a German. It was a Hanna Mix uh, 35 millimeter camera. And I was just taking pictures of everything, whatever mm-hmm. I could. Close ups. You know, I had some lenses for close ups, this stuff. You know, uh, like a lot of guys my age back then, we would play with the soldiers. Uh, you know, little toy soldiers. Sure. And I'd set, I'd set them up and I'd take pictures of them, you know, and they'd have <laughs> uh, a battle damaged tanks and, and aircraft. And I would take close ups of that, you know, the details. Then I'd take them in this, into the, the lab in high school and develop them and just see what I could do. And so by the time I was, you know, uh, graduating, I was a little bit better with the, with the, uh, uh, the cameras. So, I mean, it brings us to Kiss, which was, you know, 72, 73. And I, I was taking pictures of them in the clubs and, and trying to figure out, you know, F stops and, and exposure time. And, you know, if you don't have it the right way, then it, and they move, then you get a smear across the, across the, the film like that. Uh, so, you know, I, it took a lot of hit and miss and practice and, and learning, you know, uh, hands-on learning. Yeah. And to me, it shows because, and we'll talk about some of the KISS stuff um, in a moment, but you have, to me, I think the first really good photo of Gene Simmons spitting fire, which was yep. January 74. And the picture is, I'm going to call it professional grade. Like, it's perfect. There's one or two other photos from either that same day or the, the week before, but they're really dark and you just see a fireball. You can't even see Gene. Yours is like picture perfect. I'm like, all right, the guy who took this clearly had knew how to work a camera because that picture is just too good to be just luck of, oh, snap. Oh, look what I got. Yeah. Well, I made a habit of, of really studying my, my subject through the lens. Hmm. And I knew Gene you know, was breathing the fire. So it was just a matter of watching watching him watch himself, what he was doing. 
And one of the things that they teach fire fire eaters, fire breathers, is you have to when you hold up your your torch, you have to go back and forth, watch that torch like holding up a candle, and see where the where the uh, if there's any a breeze, where it's blowing from. Because you certainly don't want it blowing back at your face. Sure. So I'm watching Gene, watching his eyes through the lens of my camera, watching him go, you know, trying to see where the best spot is where he can, you know, uh, do it from. And then I'd watch his lips. Hmm. And he had a mouthful of the, the, the solution. Sure. So I could see what he was just about ready. And he'd go, you know, like that. And just, and he'd start to bring the torch to his face and I hit the shutter. So by the time the shutter frame opened, he had brought the torch close enough, spit the, the liquid, and pulled it back away from his face, and that's how we got that picture. Amazing, amazing photo. Now, for those who are watching and maybe don't know your backstory, right, that was January 74, the picture we're talking about. And, and you know, while people are watching this, I'll put the photo up so people could see it, right? But um, yeah. you had already been with the band, knowing the band, um, seeing the band perform for over a year at that point. So... You know, just for people who are watching, maybe don't know, to tell them, you know, obviously we, some of us know you were dating Peter's sister, but how did you get involved in the band? And when was the first time you remember seeing them? Okay, so uh, I'm, I'm, I grew up in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, uh, lived on North Henry Street between Nassau and Norman Avenue, and a family moved in around the corner from us. The Greenpoint was famous for having a bar on almost every corner. <laughs> and this family moved into uh, an apartment. We had, you know, the three family apartments around the corner from me on the corner of monitor street and norman avenue and that was peter chris's family they just moved in from from williamsburg so i used to see uh pete's mom and the and the daughters his, or his sisters uh as they'd go up and down the street going grocery shopping you know and, and, and this is this what is, like 70 71 72 that time period 72 ish yeah okay mm -hmm. uh and and you know mrs mrs chris Gola was always really nice and sweet she'd say hi to everybody if i was uh, in front of my house in my, my what we call it areaway, which was our, our little property inside the gate. You know, she'd walk by and smile, hi, how you doing? Like that, you know. <laughs> the girls didn't really interact with, with anybody. They kept to themselves. And they certainly didn't look like they fit in with the rest of the neighborhood. Their their look was very different. Uh, it was, you know, it was Italian. They had dark hair, almost sure. that Roman Romanian look. And uh, uh, so they pretty much kept to themselves. But, you know, I thought they were kind of cute. Uh, and so I, you know, we'd see them down the end of the street uh, uh, where the where the the truck yards would start in the industrial area there, and they would play ball amongst themselves like that, you know, and or if they made friends with any of the girls in the neighborhood, they would they'd be down there playing ball, and occasionally the ball would get loose and bounce towards where I was. I'd pick up the ball and bring it back over to them, so that kind of broke the ice, and and they would make some jokes. I'd make some jokes back, you know. In Brooklyn, sarcasm is a is a survival tool. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's a learned thing, you know. Yeah. So we you know, we we throw sarcastic jokes back to each other. Anyway, so we got to be friends. I started hanging out with them, and uh, I started to date uh, Joanne, uh, the the middle sister. Donna was the youngest. Then it was Joanne, and then Nancy was the older sister. Nancy already had a, a baby and, and an absent absent father, so she was a single mm -hmm. mom. All lived there, and it was uh, uh, Peter's brother Joey. He was another artist like myself, so we do, do drawings and compare notes and stuff like that. So I started dating Joanne. Uh, she, uh, back then, she looked a little bit like Cher. Hmm. Kind of had that 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 you know the, the similar nose and 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 like that you know, darker olive compl uh, complexion features like that. And and so I was going out with them, and they, at one point they said, "Well, our our big brother, he's a rock star. Our brother Peter." And and Peter had just, I think, come out of the band Chelsea at that point. Yep. They had the one album out, I think it was on CBS. And it was like, a, you know, a, a, maybe a harder version of the Grateful Dead, I guess, right. if you had to explain that like that. <clears throat> Psychedelic, you know. Um, and and he eventually, of course, as we all know now, uh, uh, history will bear out. He put that ad in Rolling Stone magazine and in uh, The Village Voice. Gene and Paul saw the ad, they got in touch with him, and next thing you know, he's rehearsing with them. So it's 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 Gene, Peter, and Paul. So on the way into Manhattan, you know, Peter had already was already married to Lydia, Lydia Chris. They were living further down South Brooklyn, Flatbush or further around that area, I think. Um he would stop by his mom's house. He'd you know, he'd borrow Lydia's uh, Chevy Nova. He'd stop at the house, you know, uh chit chat, yada yada. I see mom, see dad. See the kids, and then go zip into Manhattan to go to rehearsal. 
so it was like, you want to come? <laughs> Let me come see the band I'm in now. So was, all right. So we'd all pile in the, you know, in the, in the Nova and he'd drive us, you know, we go to the, 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 the rehearsal loft on 23rd street and, and, uh, and let me pause you for a moment. So just to make sure that I'm understanding, this is when they're a three piece, right? Ace is not in the band at this point. No, it's just the three no. piece rehearsing in the loft. Yep. Yep. Okay. Just making Eight sure I'm right call. with this. Yep. All right. And, and, you know, they were all industrial lofts. Manhattan was full of industrial lofts. So, you know, it was a, it was a pretty Spartan room. They had egg, egg crates on the walls, peeling paint where there wasn't any. Uh, and then they were set up in the, in the far end of the room from where you walk in like that. And then uh, I remember distinctly, uh, Gene had the stencil on his, he had an SVT, uh, Ampeg SVT uh, bass setup. And it said Jack Bruce stenciled on the side of it. As we know, Jack Bruce was the bass player of Cream. That was actually one of Jack Bruce's amps, I guess. you know, Wow. He bought from one of the music stores on, on 48th Street. And so uh, they would just rehearse, the three of them. You know, and, and they would look like you know, hip rockers. You know, I mean, they wore you know, tight jeans. They had the big platform shoes, platform boots, like that, the tight shirts, and they had the rock and roll hairstyles. And they were going through pretty much what we hear on the first album, which in its early stages, sure. as, it, as it was being written. And then so we go, this would happen off and on, you know, uh, every other week or so, and we're watching them rehearse, and then we take the subway back to, to, to Brooklyn. And then uh, we, we there was a... a period i guess where they were auditioning the guitar players so we weren't there for that uh, i guess that's you know it's a uh, private business or whatever sure. and then uh the next time we went up there i remember peter stopped by and said hey, we got a new guitar player in the band so we, we all went to to see them and there's ace fraley uh leaning against the wall he's wearing a gray pinstripe suit uh <laughs> a, a, i think a purple sneaker and an orange sneaker okay and and, and he's playing he's ripping leads jeff beck jimmy page type leads it was like we're all like wow where did this guy come from <laughs> right right you know and, and, and he was just leaning against the wall paul was nudging him you know come on move move get him off the wall to come and interact and move with them like that and so he kind of like yeah you know he looked like shirley mcclain which is what he, what he, thought. <laughs> he well that's interesting like hearing you say this that they had to have nudge him because if you watch these early bootleg videos from the 70s or some of the shows they've released, Paul and Gene the front, and Ace always seemed like he was in the back. In 77, 78 and forward, he would come yeah. up and he'd be singing, but he always seemed to be shyer, I'll say, when the band first started. So is that what you're saying it was like a little yeah. bit when he first... Well, you know, he's from Jendel. He was having trouble with gravity. <laughs> there you go. I love it. So, uh, you know, once he got in the platform shoes, you know, it took him a little while to get his balance, you know? Sure, like sure. Like that, so... Uh, but, uh, you know, they, at some point, like the, the story goes, they were driving around trying to come up with band names and, and they, they came up with Kiss, you know, and then Ace took the, the two S's and drew the lightning S's like mm -hmm. that. It had nothing to do with Germany, had nothing to do with the war, uh, even though uh, uh, Ace Frehley is, is, he's German himself, you know, yep. by, by, by ethnicity, but whatever. Uh, but it just looked cool. It looked like it was like two lightning bolts. That's That was the intention. Yep. So and that's that's where the, the Kiss logo came from. I guess Paul claims that he refined it somehow, whatever, made it all uniform. Right. And and uh, then they started getting ready to do shows around the you know the, the the rock scene in New York. It was literally fifty years ago this month that they did their first show, which is amazing you know, to me. And, and one of the great mysteries of life is how I've managed to elude, and not on my part, uh, every Kiss convention that has had a guest speaker. Has all I've been omitted, overlooked, whatever, for all for what I I bring to the table in the Kiss universe. You would think I'd be a, a you know an in demand speaker. I was going to bring that up and ask you if you knew why that was the case. No, I've never been asked or invited to any. I get, maybe I'm not on people's radars. I don't know. Uh, a lot of books have been written on early Kiss, and and pretty much. I'd say like like 98, 99 percent of them have nothing in there about my, me being involved in early Kiss yep. and my memories. Uh, Lydia wrote about me in her book, and then uh, a few years ago, uh, award winning writer Ken Sharp wrote, uh, you know, uh, um, nothing to lose: the making of early Kiss, seventy two to seventy five. He he reached out and sought me, and says, you know, I've noticed that you're not in any of these books. You blah blah blah. He goes, <laughs> I'm going to try and remedy that. So I'd like to interview you for my book. Uh, I've seen some of your pictures. I'd like to know if we can use those in the book like that. 
and so forth. And and he did. He he broke that fourth wall, if you will, and and finally put me in an official uh, you know book about you know in official capacity about Kiss. And a lot of people have seen that, and they've seen you know, my my Phil Maurice pictures, like the one you talked about the blowing yeah. the flame and all. And see, over the years since the internet has blossomed comes you know uh, uh hackers and pirates and thieves <laughs> come to find out a lot of my early kiss pictures have been pirated and they're on hundreds of of bootleg kiss cds yep. i don't i don't have the financial capacity like gene does to hunt each one of them down cross right and and make them you know uh, compensate me for it uh there's a, a a kiss magazine in sweden that contacted me and asked me about my pictures and when I said, yeah, on one contingency that you put in the article that these pictures you're seeing are mine and anybody else you see use it to either let them know or let me know that those pictures are being used illegally, yep. you know, unlawfully. Because I would see my pictures online with other people's watermarks on them. Oh, you that's know, horrible. That's, that just sucks. Yeah, of course. Of you know, course. so... And to me, it's surprising that through the years, you've never been asked to do a KISS convention because you have the stories that only maybe a handful of people would know from the 72, 73 time period. And you have the photos to prove it. So there's no way that you're making this stuff up. I mean, you've got photos from that time period that just, to me, yeah, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. You know, like friends of mine have said, you're kind of like the rock and roll version of Forrest Gump. And I don't mean to be derog <laughs> derogatory about it. Uh, it's like you've been all of these key places at the right time, like like the character was in the movie. Yep. And and it's, it's like, so so when this happened, you were there. When that happened, you were there. When that happened, you were there. And yeah, I, I started to write a book uh, around 2007, 2008. Uh, I just never finished it because it, mm. it takes a lot of discipline to make yourself sit down and write. Sure. Uh, I'm always being distracted by this, that, and every other thing. Uh, you know, my, my wife was a horse trainer, so I'm, I'm was constantly being pulled out to help her with horses and stuff and, and, and their care. So, uh, you know, I, it's, it's still sitting in my, my, uh, my old computer. Okay. Old, the, the files are there. I just, you know, it's going to be a long book because there's so much to put in it. There really is. But so let's talk about some of the kiss shows that you did see, right? Because it blows my mind, right? So hotel diplomat, you were at that yeah. show, right? So talk yeah. about, so I try to envision what it's like in that room that night. I've seen a couple of pictures in Lydia's book with the rope going across the stage, right? To separate the crowd from the, from the band. But yeah. like, how many people are there? What is it like being in the Hotel Diplomat that night, seeing Kiss and a few other bands? Well, it was it was a ballroom. So it was a, it was a huge room at the stage. It had mirrored columns. And uh, the stage wasn't like incredibly large. Uh, maybe 30, 40 feet wide by about 12 feet deep, something like that. Yep. You know, there was no, no drum risers. The drummers would set up on the floor like that. Uh, and oh, there was a whole bunch of rows and rows of chairs, you know, from the stage back, 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 back like that. And, uh, you know, I would sneak out of the house, you know, with, with my, my platform shoes and my, my flashy clothes. And I'd go around the corner to the Chris Gola's house and, I'd, you know, get changed over there. I mean, you know, we'd go to the, you know, take the subway, we'd go to, to New York, Times Square, you know, it was sleazy then, mm -hmm. and that's where the diplomat was. So, I mean, you know, every everything under the under the sun was there as far as fruits, nuts, and flakes. <laughs> and then we go up into the to the ballroom, and and we we uh, got ourselves front row seats right there. You know, it was about uh, five or six of us, front row center. And well, you know, this is why all the uh, the house lights are all still on. And it's, it's starting to fill up. The seats are filling up. And we hear this guy behind us saying, you know, I don't know how long this is going to, because we, we saw the, the, the Brats. We saw the Planets. We saw, uh, you know, whatever the other uh, uh, opening bands were. And uh, this guy is saying, you know, it's getting late. Maybe we should get going. I don't know if we've got time to stick around to see this band, and which was Kiss. So we all turn around, and it was it was Bill O'Coin, hmm. you know, with his, his mustache and whatever. And he was talking to one of his business associates. I never get ready to leave. And we all turn around and went, uh-uh, you can't leave. You got to stay and see this band. He's like, he looks at his business partner. He goes, really? Okay, why? What, what is so special about this band? And we just went on and on and on, you know, hyping, kiss. You got to see this band. You got to see. There's nothing else like them. There's nobody sounds like them. Nobody looks like them. They're heavy. They got all this makeup. And it's just like, all right, all right, all right. We'll, we'll stay. We'll, we'll stay for a few songs. We'll see. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, uh, on my own, I had taken it to, uh, I bought a, a whole bag of balloons. You blow them up, and I took with the magic markers, and I drew the KISS logo on them. Hmm. And then I let the air out. So, well, the thing is, they're not printed. That's just live ink. Sure. So if you if you touch it, it'll smear because it's, it's now condensed down in the rubber. So I found this out by experimentation. So I blew up about, I don't know, 50 balloons maybe and drew the KISS logo on them and, and shrank it down and very gently put them very gently in, in, a, in a box that I brought with me. So everybody, you know, we all knew what, what I had there, you know, I, so I would hand them out to, to, you know, Joanne and Donna, my friend, John Alton, uh, Amory, our friend Amory, uh, and, and each one of them blew up the balloon. And I, well, now once you blow it up, it won't, the, the ink won't smear. Right. Okay. So we, we and this, this builds behind us watching all of this. So each one of us had about, you know, maybe 10 balloons in, in our arms. So kiss comes on There's the opening uh, hook to uh, deuce. And they launch into the song, and the stage lights go up, and we all jumped up at the same time and just launched all these balloons at them. Oh, they never knew it was coming. Right. <laughs> and Gene's going like this. He's looking around. He's watching all these balloons flying around the stage. Paul's kicking them. Gene's trying to stomp on them and, and break them like that. <laughs> it was it was built-in promo that they didn't even expect. Right, 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 right. And Bill Coyne's watching this. <laughs> that's how exuberant we were about how – we had never heard a band sound like them before. Sure, they were they were heavy. We never heard chord arrangements like that. We, I mean, the, the harmonies were kind of like the Beatles, but their their hooks, the power, the sound, it just it just blasted right into you, and and it was a very exciting band to see in their infancy at that that time. So uh, of course, Bill Coyne stayed for more than two songs. He stayed right. for the whole, <laughs> the whole show. Right, well, and the rest like is that. history, of course. <laughs> yeah, and then after the show, you know, I, I found out where backstage was, and I went to say hi to Gene, and as Bill and Gene are talking to each other, and I walk up to him, and I start doing my Gene Simmons imitation. You know, <laughs> if you really like this band, you know, Bill, there's really something about this band. We just can't put up, like, and Gene's, like, standing there going, ah, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Bill was laughing. He goes, this guy is the reason I stayed to see you. And Gene goes, oh, really? I said, well, him and his all his friends are out front. He said, we were going to leave, and they convinced us to stay. So I have that to my credit, you know. Very cool. That's, that's an awesome, awesome story. Now, let me ask you this. You know, people have heard some of the early recordings that have leaked out from 73, and one of the things that always jumps out at me is Peter was always very vocal in between songs, talking to the crowd. Wasn't the, I'll say, typical drummer just sitting back there playing drums. Obviously, over the years, that changed, right? But what do you remember about Peter as a performer in those early club mm -hmm. shows? Was, was I guess more of the seasoned veteran than Gene and Paul. Uh, uh, Gene and Paul already did some recording with uh, 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 Wicked Lester. Else? Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I have the CD like like twenty feet from here. Uh, yes, Wicked Lester. But Peter had already done the full album with with uh, you know uh, Chelsea. He he played the clubs, New York. You know he was he was older. He was the oldest guy in the band. So. Uh, he was more of the assertive Italian, you know, uh, he was in gangs, you know, he was, <laughs> right. he was, you know, he's the typical you know, assertive Italian Brooklynite, you know, and, and so, you know, you try to put something past him that he's not going to buy. He's going to tell you right off the front, you know, <laughs> screw that, hell with that or whatever you want to you know, say it, uh, fuck that. Uh, and, and so, you know, I guess he would try to establish his personal boundaries as who he was as, as a, as a persona in the band. Gene was always a, a smart ass, a sarcastic, arrogant, smart ass. <laughs> and, and Paul seemed to have this attitude like, you know, there was nothing cooler than him. You know? mm. And at these, I, I, I get it. These things are things you bring to the table to to, I, you know, create your your uh, your identity and your personality on stage and whatnot. You know, and Paul was really good about being the front guy. doing all, He did most of the talking. But, um, yeah, Peter, he, he would say a couple of things here and there. But once. Uh, uh, Management stepped in, and then Bill Bill brought in Sean Delaney, yep, who who, who taught them all of their choreography. Uh, he brought in the the, the fire breathing, uh, the blood, all of that. Uh, Sean was like an off Broadway choreographer and yep. a writer and like that. So once Sean came in, now he started to shave away the stuff they don't need and rebuild the things that are their strengths. 
yeah. like that. So, so a lot of that had to do with Sean saying, you know, okay, uh, Peter, I need you to say a little bit less. Uh, Paul, you need to work on that. Gene, you need to do this. Don't go out into the audience and grab the people by their by their wrists and make them clap. <laughs> right? Yeah. Don't make, don't make them clap. You know, like that, and and so on. So, Sean really honed in a lot of what they were doing. So you would say it was more Sean and Bill, I'll say, taming Peter and, and tell him to not talk as much as opposed to Paul saying, hey, this is my gig, Pete, you be quiet. No, it was nothing like that that I remember. OK, uh, you know, <laughs> Bill, Bill handled the business. He was in the television business. Uh, he left he left the, the personal management directly to Sean. You know, and then Sean was arranged to, to their look, you know, refined it. He went to the uh, the S&M B&D uh, uh, supply houses. Uh, for those who don't know, that's uh, uh, bondage, discipline, sadomasochism. <laughs> uh, well, you know, Bill was, as you know, was gay, yeah. and Sean was gay. They, they were a, kind of an item. So Sean had his finger on the pulse of all of the gay community in, in, in uh, 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 um, you know, uh, in the village in New York and West Side and all that. So there were there were a few stores that that made and supplied that kind of accoutrement. Oh, I spoke <laughs> French. No, uh, you know, this, this, <laughs> the studded leather belts and things like that. So uh, Sean had some stuff custom made for them. And that's where all the early studded, the black and silver theme came in. Sure. They, they didn't want to look like the New York dolls. It was, they tried that early on. It didn't work for them. They were too, too muscular, too big sure. like that. They, they weren't, you know, skinny, frail little guys like a lot of the other bands were. So they had to come across like truck drivers, you know, like, like monsters. Yep. And, and that's, yep. that's, so that's what Sean helped to do with them. Absolutely. Now, I know, remember in reading uh, Lydia's book, one of the things that fascinated me is that, and a lot of KISS fans don't notice or don't remember it, during 73, while KISS was doing those club shows, Peter was also still playing in other bands at that time, right? The cover bands. Did you go see Peter's other bands or were you only really into Peter with the KISS stuff? I didn't know that. I, oh, okay. Yeah. Lydia wrote that in her book that during that time he was doing like cover bands that was doing like 50s type stuff or whatever, just kind of make ends meet. Well, I know he was doing that before he was in Kiss. Yep. Yep. Yeah. She so said he know. did it during 73 also until once Bill got them the contract. Yeah. I I, I didn't I have yet to read Lydia's book. I have to get a copy of it. Uh, great book. But yeah, I I I don't know. I didn't know that he was still, you know, seeing other women on the side. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I guess it's 50 years later, so I guess it all worked out okay. So yeah, yeah. So that, that's the hotel diplomat show that we were just talking about. Do you remember roughly how many people were there that night? Ballpark. Are we talking a thousand? Are we talking fifty? Uh, well, let me. My mind's eye. Uh, eh, maybe a hundred people. Maybe a hundred fifty. Wow. Two. I don't know. I, I'm trying to remember the dimensions of the uh, of the of the the size of the ballroom. Uh, there's a there's a line in, in Alien Three where they where Bishop is all beat up and crushed up, and Ripley's trying to bring him back to to bring his computer back online he goes it's dark in here ripley i'm not what i used to be so <laughs> well this like, 50 I, years i'm asking you to remember what a room looked like 50 years ago so yeah i mean i'm trying to i i, I can close my eyes and see parts of it right. and then it's just it's like in a dream you can see detail to here and then it just fades right but it sounds yeah. like it was probably a, a couple hundred people probably give yeah. or take a little bit right at, at, at most yeah right now and you were also at the coventry shows that they did in december and that's where some of your photos that you took uh that like you were talking about before is all over online now so talk about the coventry and and what was that place like because to me that always just seemed a little bit like a it's actually a there's actually there's somebody writing a book about coventry yeah and he's trying to do some research on on getting pictures of what it looked like inside the club uh, i was still in high school and i was i try to make make fake ids to get into these clubs and then also uh i knew where the stores were in new york that that sold rock star clothing so i had a pair of like uh, uh burgundy uh, satin pants i had platform shoes i had you know flashy shirts and whatnot and i was starting to try to do my hair up a little bit you know it was like my, my high school teenage long hair uh actually well well peter gave me my first rock and roll haircut <laughs> over at, at the Criscola's house oh man how did you know, that come out well, well, it came out pretty good, actually. Uh, 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 the hairdresser from England, Paul McGregor, initially uh, 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 introduced that hairstyle. Uh, if you if you look on the back of the uh, uh, Rod Stewart and the Small Face, is not as good as a wink to a blind horse. 
Okay. <laughs> you, you'll see the you see the marionettes, the, the puppets. Yep. And you see Rod Stewart's hair, it's all sticking up on top. And and Ronnie Wood, the guitar, his hair is the same. Those were they called him the rooster. Because your hair stuck up like rooster feathers. <laughs> and but it was in layers like that. And it gave a, 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 a sense of fullness and thickness to the hair. And then the sides would come down straight. The sweet looked like that. Uh Queen, uh a Mata Hoople. Uh, uh, you know, and, and the English, the, the British glam bands, you know, they were they sure. were getting that shaped, layered haircut. And then it came across the pond over to America and the bands in New York were starting to get that haircut. Uh, we, we'd get a newspaper from England called uh, Melody Maker. And it was a, there was another newspaper and we could see all of, you know, what the bands looked like, what they were wearing, the fashions, the bell bottoms, uh, uh, everything was in. I, so I, there was a newsstand there in Great Point. I get, used to get these papers these rock papers from England. So I'd snatch those up and I could kind of try and stay up on what was, you know, what was hip and current. So Pete, you know, I, I gave him my friend. He says, get me a pair of scissors and two Bud tall boys. You know, Budweiser <laughs> 16 ounce. Like yeah. And I got him the scissors and the two beers. And I said, you know, uh, the Chris Golas didn't have a, uh, a backyard. Their, their kitchen window opens out to a roof, which was over a, a, a one story garage. So they had all their chairs and tables. You know, we'd sit out there and have little barbecues. And that's, I sat there and Peter cut my hair and came, cut me all these layers. And then I went back to my house around the corner and my grandmother goes, it's too long. I don't like it. It's too long. <laughs> <laughs> and I go back to, to, to you know, Peter. I said, uh, they're telling me it's still too long. He goes, what is she, nuts? <laughs> <laughs> he, he did a little step here, a little step there. Anyway, so... Uh, I, I to get back to your point, I, I had a rock and roll look. I could kind of right. so, start to blend in with some of the, you know, the the rockers. We didn't have sayings like poser back then. Sure, you know, there mm-hmm. was there was no such thing. If you looked like you belonged to the rock scene, you were welcomed. It was like a show of support. So the audience looked just like the bands. The band looked like the audience, and 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 so like that. And and uh, so I was able to sneak into Coventry with my camera. Mm-hmm. You know, they could see it's a really nice camera. I say, I'm here to shoot the band, or I'm here to shoot the band. I'm here to shoot the band. I, uh, all right, go ahead. You know, and I, I wasn't drinking, so uh, I went and I, I shot uh, pictures of the Brats. Uh, I shot uh, the Harlots of 42nd Street. Uh, I shot ISIS. I shot Turn Down Broadway, uh, Flaming Youth, and I still have the negatives. They're they're buried wow. somewhere. I haven't since we moved here. There's stuff I still even haven't unpacked a year later. But uh, uh, I still have all the negatives for all of that. And, and of course, uh, I shot pictures of Kiss uh, to bring us to back to your point. The pictures of Kiss, all right, my camera, I think, was being repaired. I borrowed a box camera from the photo department in, our, in school. I didn't know quite know how to use a box camera, which is you have to look down into the top of it. Okay. Like that. And then you see what, what the lens is seeing. And then, you know, here I am trying to figure out, again, the F stops. How do you, you push it here? How, where, where do I open the – how long do I open my shutter for? Stuff like that. And that's that's resulted in some of the pictures of them looking, like I said, smeared. There's a shot of Gene okay. going, going across like that. And then his white makeup is smeared. <laughs> okay. Like mm-hmm. and, he, and he looks a little bit like uh, – and he he was a big fan of this movie. Uh, um, it wasn't – not, not – uh, Oh, uh, Carnival of Souls. Mm, okay, that was one of one of Gene's favorite movies. Because the uh, one of the main pro- antagonists in the film was this guy. We had white face and black around his eyes, and he couldn't look like Grandpa Munster, you know. And he's terror he's terrorizing this woman who is who is existing between the worlds of life and death. She was a she was in a car accident off a bridge. So this whole movie, she's like going back and forth between life and death. And this character reminds me of Gene. Uh, this is uh, his face looked like that in some of the pictures because of, of the blur as he went across the screen. That's like and, that. and what's interesting is obviously Kiss fans know there was a Kiss album, Carnival of Souls, twenty five some odd years after that. Yeah. So and I I never knew that there was a movie and that Gene that was one of his favorites at that time in the, in the early seventies. Interesting fact. I can, I can, I, I get the links off of uh, YouTube. I can send you the links so you'll see yeah. exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, for, I'd love for, to... for, for reference. Yeah. That, that's now. I know. Obviously, there's got to be at least I'm going to say a half dozen photos I've seen of yours from the Coventry shows. You mentioned before about the different slides that you have that that you you know you still haven't scanned. 
any chance that you have more kiss photos in there that that you haven't shared with people uh just you know by by the film or east show the, the promo show uh okay when they when they were being officially uh announced to the world you know uh, uh like that for casablanca yep and yeah and i got some i was i was as close to ace almost as i am to you on the screen wow uh you know i mean i was at the foot of the stick a lot of the seats in, in the front of the stage there was nobody in them for whatever reason uh you know so they one of those pictures you can even see where the some of the the, the velvet is torn and the, the filling is coming out of the back of the seat <laughs> yeah. but i was like right up ace was like right there in front of me you know uh, i'm like what six feet eight feet from his knees sure so i'm taking this you know and he, he would do this thing where he'd bend his knees down like that you know and i'm i got shots of you know he's leaning back like that and uh oh, wow. I, I got some nice shots of the lights coming through uh there was a big rope spider web yep that was left there i might i think they said it would have been left over from alice cooper or something was left there and and the lights coming through the the, the rope like that so yeah that's that's the pictures i pretty much oh um we took buses down to South Jersey and we saw Kiss play at the Sunshine Inn in Asbury Park. Ooh. And they couldn't, the ceiling on the stage was too low. Yep. They couldn't put the, the Kiss sign up. They had to put it on stage right next to Gene. Hmm. So the, the giant, you know, and it was almost as tall as Gene was. And, and it's sitting on the side of the stage. I took pictures of that. Again, I had a little problem with the camera that night. Uh, some of them I got like a half half picture and then half nothing, yeah. uh, and then s some of the stuff it came out kind of a little fuzzy. But I, I I think I sent those pictures also to Ken Sharp. Uh, uh, you know everything I had I sent to him, so he okay. had, he was able to pick whatever it was he wanted to use. That's like awesome. That. Now the Fillmore East show that you were talking about before was right after the New Year, and during that like 10, 15 day period, and the Fillmore East show specifically. Paul changed his makeup to the bandit was what people call it. Do you remember that? And do you remember any discussions the band was talking about, about Paul changing the makeup? Um, I really wasn't there on the, on their, their inside conversations yeah. about it. It was just something Paul was, was experimenting with because it was like either asymmetrical or balanced. Right. And he had that, that raccoon bandit thing <laughs> yeah. going on. I think they did some promotional pictures some posters and things like that just to kind of see how it looked. And then, uh, um, then they decided, you know what, just just go back to the star, and, and yeah. just like that. So that was that was like an in, in, in house thing with them. They were gotcha. they were trying to figure that out. Yeah. Yep, of course. So now Kiss obviously records the album. They go out on tour. Do you remain a fan as their popularity starts to increase, or do you start to say, hey, this is a kitty band in '79, and I've lost interest in them? Well. Uh, Right before I graduated high school in 74, I tried to get Kiss to play at my high school. Hmm. And it wasn't like they, they didn't want to. They wanted to. Uh, it was a matter of me trying to convince the, uh, the, the school board to allow this band in. Uh, it, it definitely would have blown the roof off of the, off the school <laughs> mm -hmm. playing in the, you know, in the auditorium. I didn't really have enough promotional tools at my disposal so, I guess to properly present who this band was, and they had no idea. Nobody knew who this who Kiss was yet, yet at this point. Sure. I mean, my friends knew about it. Uh, you know, I would talk about it. I was probably the hippest guy in school, you know, wearing platforms <laughs> and velvet corduroy, and you know, I, I looked like an English rocker. Yeah. I, I took I took my cue from what the English rockers look like. I had you know velvet corduroy, uh, single breasted blazers, I had rhinestones on my clothes, uh, like that. So everybody knew me as this rock guy in school, and I just couldn't convince the the you know the the committee, the dance whatever the uh, the school board to let me get this band. And I Kiss was going to make like three hundred bucks, three four hundred bucks, and they, the school finally went. You know, I don't know, uh, hmm. hem and haw. No, we're just going to pass on it. So I had to give you know the band the bad news. Gene was mad. He called me up at my house. He was mad. I said, <laughs> "What do you want me to do? They don't know who you yeah. are." Right. Don't be this, mad at like me. you said, this is 74, right? The album was out or not out yet? 73, 74. Okay. Uh, I think it was right before the album came out. Right. And I said, I, I they don't know who you are, so don't be mad at me. I tried. Sure. You know, now in, in my own young promotional mind, for what it was, uh, when they were getting ready to do the show at the Fillmore East, in order for me to try and, and expand their popularity... Uh, I made these little 
uh, uh, kiss like like tickets with a logo on it to promote them playing at the Fillmore East, and it said, you know, uh, uh, guests who who was uh, 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 guests, you know, I forgot exactly how I worded it. Um, but, you know, potential guests who are going to show up, you know, to be to see them, and it was Allison Steele from WNEW FM. And and Todd Rundgren and this one and Rick Derringer and that one and I put these people's names on there, and I had a, you know access to a, a mimeograph copier in school before we had Xerox machines, and I ran off you know about a hundred or so of these and I give them out to my friends. You got to come see the show. You got to come see the show. You got to you know like like flyers before there was flyers, right? Yeah, or like that. And so somebody showed up at the stage door with one of these little tickets that I made. And they said, where did you get that from? We got it from this guy, Rick Fox. <laughs> really? Wait here. And they, they, I was sitting, you know, in the, uh, in the auditorium. Gene and Paul came over and they read me the riot act. Really? Oh, yeah. Do you not realize what you did? You put people's names on there. We can't guarantee. So we can get in trouble for that. We can get sued for that. Hmm. Paul's like, I should just beat your ass right here and now. <laughs> I didn't think I didn't know how to properly respond and come back to that to make sense to them. Right. You know, but they were, they were like berating me for, for promoting them. Right. Right. You had well intentions, obviously. Yes. It was obviously good intentions. I was, right. I said, nobody knows who you are outside of your, your <laughs> circle outside of Manhattan. I said this, I'm trying to get people from my school to come see you, Right. you know, and, and I guess it, maybe it didn't sink in a while. They did. It seemed like Paul has been mad at me ever since then. Oh, really? So when was the last time you saw the guys then? <sighs> the book signing. Okay. When when when, when uh, uh, nothing to lose came out. Yep. And they they had a a, a book signing there, and and uh, I went there with with a friend of mine who was uh, acting like my security, and my wife <laughs> Tamara. Uh, Ken, Ken invited us. Ken okay. said come. Ken said come to the book signing because I want you to sign a couple of books too. Went, oh, okay, cool. So they had me standing in a, in a uh, you know, the line was like, you know, from, from where the Gina and Paul are sitting at a table and there's a line and it goes all the way back to the store and then outside. And I was standing in this, this roped off VIP area. So uh, Gina, uh, my, my, my friend Eric, he goes, because Gina and Paul, they keep looking at you and looking at you and looking at you. I had my, my uh, uh, buckskin fringe jacket on and my, I think my cowboy hat or whatever. And, because they're looking at you, they're trying to figure out. They're looking at you, looking at you. So I finally, when when the line was pretty much done, I went up to have my book signed, and Paul looked up at me. So he goes, "Hi," you know, you know. And I seen Gene, Gene, Gene made a you know funny comment or something. It was nice to see you. Nice to see you too. And signed my book, and that was it. They really didn't. Was it like, "Hey, how you doing?" Long now, time did they see. did they know who you were? Did they recognize you, or was it just like a polite, "Hey, nice to see you"? I mean, I look like I look now, but I, <laughs> they said, "I said you remember me." They went, "Yes." So G goes, "Yes, I know who you are." <laughs> okay, like that. And but Paul still just had that attitude, right? You know, as long as I've known him, he's always had that attitude. Unfortunate, so, I guess I'll say. Now, yeah, who so would have the, thought? That... Who would have thought fifty years later? Right. So you go back to nineteen seventy three. 74, seeing them in the clubs. Would you think 50 years later, people would still be talking about the band? Well, I mean, look at the success they've had. Of course, people are going to talk about <laughs> Well, of course, right. Uh, but did you anticipate that success when you were seeing them in 73? Uh, we knew they were going to be big. We didn't know how big. Right. We knew, we knew they were going to make an impact on somebody. Mm -hmm. We never dreamed that, that you know, they became you know, the, the KISS world. Right. Yeah. You know? uh, actually, uh, at one point, uh, there was a show in L.A. where Faster Pussycat opened for Fraley's Comet. And Peter was there. Yep. And we, we, we took pictures together like that. And then uh, I saw Ace at a NAMM show in Anaheim. And he had a he has a he had on a, a Beanie and Cecil T-shirt. <laughs> OK. Those who remember the cartoon. Yep. And he, he goes, I he say, hey, remember, he goes, oh, yeah, the kid from Brooklyn. That, that's what he called me. The kid. From oh, Brooklyn. Wow. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Let's take a picture. Let's take a picture like that. So. You know, and I have I have those pictures as well. Uh, Ace was always nicer to me, and and uh, I, I got a funny Ace story. Uh, we're at Max's Kansas City one night. He came to see the Bratz play. I think it was one of his. Whenever he was not on the road, he was in town. He would hang out with Rick Rivets, who was with a, with a guitar player who who was his buddy from the Bratz. Rick Rivets was the guy who who originally created the New York Dolls, yep. and then he got uh, pushed out of the band. 
So I, I knew Rick. I was friends with Rick. And and so whenever Ace was in town, he'd call up Rick and they'd go clubbing together like that. They were they were best buddies. So we're upstairs at Max's by the dressing rooms. And Ace was, as usual, blind, out of his mind, drunk. <laughs> yep. And all you, you just know Ace was in the in the room or in the building by that hysterical cackle from his laughter, <laughs> you know, that hysterical, that hyena laugh. And uh, he he inadvertently tri- tripped or something, fell backwards, lost his balance, and he went ass first into one of those big industrial plastic trash cans. <laughs> and he's now he's he's just sitting in the can with his legs his legs <laughs> come sticking out over the can. And it was like that scene in Arthur when he falls out of the limo. And he's like, "Bitter man, I fell out of the limo." Isn't that the funniest thing you ever? Seen? And he's, you know, and he's he's perpetuating his own laughter at how funny it was. <laughs> and so his ass is stuck in the can. He can't get out, and he's laughing at the fact that he can't get out. And everybody's trying to pull him up out of the can. And we eventually had to turn the can upside down so he'd fall out of it because mm-hmm. it was wedged in. Like that, and we're all standing there laughing. And, right, and of course. <laughs> he he dropped this little plastic laminated card, or, or and it said, "My name is Ace Fraley. If found, please return to, you know, to a coin management or whatever it was." Like that. And, and I I found that, and I, I don't know what happened to it oh, over the years. Right. That's 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 my funny Ace Fraley story. For some reason that story doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In seventy five. Uh, I was still working in Manhattan uh, at, a, at a printing company uh, on, on Madison and 52nd. And I'm sitting there on the steps between the fountains one day. I'm, I'm having my lunch and this girl walks by and I look at her and she looks at me and we had the same haircut. You know, that, that rooster, <laughs> that sh- this, what they yeah. call a sh- this is called a shag haircut. So it's like, wow, two creatures on, on a <laughs> noticed each other out of all of these people. And she goes, who are you? And I said, I'm, I'm Rick Fox. And she goes, oh, who, I don't know who, who that is. And, and we start talking about rock and roll and bands and stuff. And the, she was uh, she hung out on the rock scene in Manhattan. And she told me about Max's Kansas City. Uh, and she goes, have you ever been there? I said, I don't know. I never heard of it. She goes, wow, you never heard of Max's Kansas City? Oh, my God, you got to see this place. <laughs> and, and I said, well, I don't know where it is. And she, so we, we made a date where I, I met her. I took the train in Manhattan. It was like a. 17th Street, uh, right, right where Fifth and Sixth Avenue kind of splits, okay. by right by the Triangle Building, and uh, and so she she brought me, got into Max's, and she's introducing me to all of these people. Here is there's Blondie singing backup for another band before she was Debbie Harry Blondie. Okay, yeah, like that, uh, like that, and and it was packed. There was a bar downstairs. There was a bar upstairs. There's a the restaurant was was full, and I'd never seen anything like. This is my first step into the rabbit hole, mm. you see. And then she introduced me to this guy she knew was a guitar player from this group called the Martian Rock Band. And uh, uh, his name was Sebi, Sebi Castle. Now he's, he's Sebastian. Uh, he's he's a, a psychic medium and magician. Sebi and I clicked immediately because we're big fans of, of the 50s and 60s uh, sci-fi movies. Okay. You know, Day the Earth Stood Still, Commando Cody from the old Republic serials. Uh, you know, we had a real, uh, a real good uh, uh, level playing field icebreaker of talking about we're big fans of all of this genre. And he says, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a bass player, but I'm really not that good yet. He goes, well, he goes, I'd like to replace the guy we have. That's the first one. I've spent a lot <laughs> of my career replacing other bass players. Okay. <laughs> looking back in retrospect. So uh, <laughs> he says, well, he gave me the address of the rehearsal loft. Just come up to the loft and, and, and uh, uh, let's see what we, we, we can do. So I go in there, I bring my bass. And, uh, and he was very kind and patient in showing me, here's A, here's D, here's C, here's B, <laughs> here's E. Here's the, you can do, and, and a lot of the, his, the songs, the Martian rock band songs, and, and it was like punk, space beats punk. Uh, Sebi would call it, said, we're a, we're a spunk band. Like that, <laughs> okay. I like and I that. got to see I got to see one of their shows before I joined. So when I got in, and he made the decision to keep me, we had to start reassessing what we were going to do on stage. And now here comes the idea guy, you know, promotions, <laughs> ideas, yeah. and and so in the first song, he says the, the he introduces each member of the band and says where they're from, and he says the bass players from Mercury. I'm like, okay, great. Now I'm from Mercury. Now what do I do? But what what could I create? What could I become 
as a science fiction space character from Mercury. Right. Well, Mercury is a hot planet. Well, there mm -hmm. ain't much going on there life-wise. And I said, well, in our southwestern American deserts, we have lizards. You know, that they're, they're not around water, but they're still mm -hmm. lizards. Mm -hmm. And my favorite universal monster was the creature from the Black Lagoon. Okay, yeah. So that's a reptilian. And, and so I tried to create myself into a reptilian, a lizard <laughs> character. Okay. <laughs> I essentially blended Ace Frehley and Gene Simmons into one persona. Oh, wow. Like that. So I, I had this little vanity down in the basement at our house. And, and I sat there and I was experimenting with, with makeup, you know, different kinds of makeups. Okay. And I found this cream eyeshadow. It comes in little tubes. And uh, I got a, a black spandex Capizio bodysuit, turned it around backwards so the zipper would open in the front. And I put rhinestones on it. That If you look at the Kiss Alive album, the first one, and you could see uh, uh, what looked like a, a, a meteor shower of, of rhinestones on Ace's leg. Yep. So I copied that on, on one side of the costume. I, I managed to, to iron on without melting the, 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 the rubber in the, the spandex. Uh, these little silver stars. So I had stars and, and this rhinestones on it. Uh, I found a pair of silver boots that came up just over the ankles on, on Lexington Avenue, 50 something street. Uh, and they had studs in the, in the platforms that looked like the studs that were in the movie rollerball. Okay. Okay. So, and I, and if you know, after a while, uh, Ace had different kinds of boots. He had boots that came up to his ankles that were yep. silver. So it kind of looked a little like that. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, um, uh, so I would I put this green, frosty green green color on my skin, and my neck, my face, whatever was exposed, and uh, I would take a black eyeliner pencil, and then upside down I would draw scales from my my stomach <laughs> coming all the way up to my neck, oh, man. and then I would cover my eyebrows and 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 my first eyebrow up in here in the eyes was red, and then from red I went to blue. And I had eyebrows like Spock from Star Trek. <laughs> and then it was blue. And then in my mouth, uh, I would put uh, a couple of drops of green food coloring. So now the inside of my mouth was green. So Gene would spit, Gene would spit blood. Right. 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 I, would, I would take a mouthful of beer, and as it would foam up in my mouth, <laughs> it would like, be like, green. It's like, it like putting alka seltzer in your mouth with water. And there's this green foam would just come Ooh. pouring out of my mouth. So I got to pause you for a second here. Rick. Do you have any pictures of this? Yeah. I'm trying to visualize this. I'm like, this sounds crazy and fun all at once. Yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, well, when David Bowie was alive, when he was just after his Ziggy Stardust era, yep. uh, he had a photographer that worked for, you know, his production, his management production was main man. Right. So his photographer was a guy named Lee Black Childers. Okay. From from uh, Kentucky, and Lee was real. It was a real uh, you know uh, uh, mainstay on the New York rock scene. Uh, and Lee Lee loved us. He, he saw what we looked like. He says, "Oh my God, I've got to come take pictures of you guys." So he came to our loft and we did a photo session. So the black and white pictures that I'll send you are the pictures by Lee Black Childers, uh, hmm. one of which wound up in Rock Scene Magazine in New York. And, and that's so that's what I did. I created this this lizard this humanoid lizard character <laughs> again nobody was doing all of this back then you know to, to me i was a little too young to be going to the clubs in the 70s uh, i grew up in brooklyn right but i was too young to be going to the clubs but i always envisioned throughout the decade first there was a lot of theatrical bands kiss the dolls etc and then as the decade progressed you got the ramones Blondie, you mentioned before, a little bit more of a punk scene, CBGBs. Um, but it sounds like you kind of leaned a little bit more towards the theatrical side of the music scene. Is that, is that fair to say? Well, like I said, the, the music was semi-punk. Okay. Uh, and, and hard rock and 50s doo-wop, uh, like that. Uh, it's just What was the name of the band? I don't know if you said it, I missed it. Yeah, the Martian Rock Band. And, and through doing this... We wound up endearing ourselves to the Max's crowd. People are like, wow, whoa, this is not the same Martian rock band I remember from two months ago. <laughs> right. You know, like that. And, you know, and I, so I started rubbing shoulders with the Ramones and, and the Tough Darts, uh, Robert Gordon, uh, um, you know, the Dolls, all these. We were all hanging out together in the same clubs. Sure. 
there's every Christmas they uh, the the New York Rocks uh, Facebook page they post a picture that Bob Gruen shot of of the uh, Christmas party at Max's, and everybody would get together and squeeze in the picture, and it, and there's a picture of me in the back going, and I've got my shirt up. It says Martian <laughs> Rock Band, and they got oh, me cut awesome. off. I'm oh. cut off. Like, from, you can see me from here down. <laughs> uh, we were together for I don't know five or six months, and then and then uh, the band broke up. So I go back to working downtown in the village in Manhattan, you know, on, on Eighth Street. I'm like just a few doors down from Electric Lady Studios, and this guy and this girl walk in, rock and roll looking guy, and and I, I had you know my I looked rock and roll of course, and then uh, it's like, well, what do you do? I said I'm a bass player. He goes, oh really? I think we may be looking to replace our bass player as number two. <laughs> as number two, right? <laughs> as number two. Yeah. I said, what's the name of the band? He said, Virgin. And I said, I think I see the picture of you guys in Rock Scene Magazine. You're standing like you're down at Jersey Shore on a boardwalk. He says, yeah, that's us. And I went, okay. And and they had an Alice Cooper show that this, this, the singer would come out with a eight, nine foot boa stake constricted around his And he had makeup like Alice Cooper, like that. And they did a David Bowie set. They did an Alice Cooper set. We did a Kiss set. We did a Mata Hoople set. Uh, we did Queen. You know, whatever was the British wave of glam like that. And we changed the name to Lust for about two weeks, maybe three. And then during this interim, I had come up with the name Sin. And that's where Sin was born like that. And then uh, we we played, like I said, you know, Jersey. We, uh, we There was a club in the Bronx called the Rolling Stone. We, we closed that club. Uh, we were the last band to play there. Ian Ian was leaving the band to go play drums in Angel Face because he was going to make more money. So, uh, you know, he left the band. I got all upset. Band broke. Sin broke up at that point. And then uh, I was, again, working either downtown in the village or there was a marketing research firm up in, in midtown Manhattan I was working at. And the phone rings one day, and it's these two guys from, from the group called the E. Walker Band out of Jersey. Uh, they played six nights a week, three, four sets, four sets a night, uh, full Jersey circuit. Like I said, you know, six nights a week, Monday you had off. And I don't remember how they said they got my number, but they said, you came recommended to us. We want to replace our bass player. <laughs> number three. <laughs> <There's> three. <laughs> and, and that was, I, as soon as I walked in, they saw me show up. They went like that. They went over to the bass player and said, you're fired. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just like he didn't even know it was coming. He didn't see it. Oh. He didn't know it. Mm. He just said, You're fired. Mm -hmm. and he looks over at me and he goes, They did it to me. They're going to do it to you too. Watch. The, the I, million I, dollar I, question is Did they end up doing it to you also? Did that's, they get later in the, that's much later in the story. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, they did it. They did oh, that to me. No. They did it to me. So we started to put a new band together and we were like a much heavier version. Of of a of a cover band than what I was doing with E Walker. We were doing Iron Maiden, Rush, uh, 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 Judas Priest, S Scorpions, Van Halen, uh, you know whatever was the real heavy heavy stuff okay. like that. And that's what that's what I was doing. I, we were playing uh, opposite E Walker and pulling some of E Walker's crowd now to come see us like that. And then it's sometime during this this time, uh, I was. When I was working in the village at, at one of those shops there on 8th Street, these kids come walking in from California. They, they came to, to New York to see Twisted Sister play some uh, festival. Okay. And they came, happened to walk into my store. I'm like, why? Wow, rock and roll guy. Who are you? What do you do? You know, and, and was, I guess I was the, the first authentic rock looking guy that they saw. <laughs> I said, I'm a, I'm a bass player. I said, you know, I, I played with this band, this band, this band. And, and I said, who are you? I said, we're going to see Twisted Sister. I said, all those guys are friends of mine. I said, wow, really? <laughs> yeah, really. You know, I, I've known Mark Mendoza since he was in the Dictators before he was in Twisted Sister. Yep, yep. So Mark was Mark was like my big brother. He's, you know, friends of mine. Okay. You know, and, and I knew, you know, JJ and Eddie and all those guys. Uh, never got along with D. D was always an asshole really? to me. Well, you know, he's awesome. open that that he was not the easiest guy to get along with at that time. He was, but he even, like I said, I look like a rock and roll guy. Right. He doesn't want anyone in the audience to look rock and roll, but him and his band. Interesting. And he would have this really bad habit. And they put all the house lights on, all the gel. They took all the gels out of the front lights. And they're all white light. Okay. And it would light up the audience. And he'd point somebody out and he'd single them out and he'd harass them hmm. in the crowd and get everybody to boo that person. <laughs> well, guess, guess who his next target oh, was? Oh, no, you. 
Oh, look at this Fergie guy. Thinks he's so cool. Hip rock and roll guy, right? Yeah, you know, we're the stars in this, like, this show tonight. We're the stars on stage. Not you. And he get the whole audience to boo at me, you know. <laughs> that's 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 how much of an ass he was. Mm. You know, or, if, or if I'm hanging out by the side of the stage, he would try to get me thrown out. And then, you know, then Mark would come over and go, "What? What? why is D hysterical? Right. Why is D yelling? He goes, I don't want that guy here. I don't want that guy here. Mark goes, he's a friend of mine. He's my guest. You know, and, and the manager's going, what do I do? What do I do? Do I kick right. him out or I leave him here? Mark right, goes, right. he's my, Mark says, he's my friend. He's staying. And manager goes, all right. D would get mad and he'd stomp off and have his little you know hissy fit. Right. So he's always been that way to me. Anyway. So, so uh, these kids were in New York to see Twisted Sister. And, and they said, you know, you look like you would fit in this band that we know back in California. They're called uh, Circus Circus. Alrighty, there you have it. The exciting first part of my interview with Rick Fox. How great was that hearing stories about seeing Kiss firsthand from somebody who was there in 1972 and 1973 during the club days. That was really great stories, Rick. Thanks so much for sharing them with us. It was also really great to hear about the New York rock scene in the clubs during the 70s. That was so much fun hearing as well. I can tell everybody watching and listening, if you enjoyed part one, you're going to love part two, where Rick talks about his experience being a member of Wasp, Steeler, an experience he had with the Vinnie Vincent invasion, and much more. The second part will be equally, maybe even more exciting than this first part. You guys are going to really love it, I promise you. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. If you're listening to one of my podcasts, subscribe over there as well. Also, head on over to Facebook and follow my page, The Rock Experience with Mike Brunn, where each and every day we talk about all the rock and roll music that you love. You could also follow me on Instagram and Twitter as well. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you all next time.